I am glad, I am excited, and uh, it's a great priv uh, privilege to share the Word of God with you all here tonight. I hope you got your Bibles here. Let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 tonight. Uh, you know, saying, I'm a child of God. I just came from our our uh, west location and we just finished our, our Tamil service. I jumped straight out of there into a car and over here and we sang, I am a child of God in Tamil. And uh, if you want to know how to do that, I'm not real good at this, but we sang, I am a child of God. It's Yesuvin Ilainan, that is, I am a child of God. So there you go. If you want to sing that in, uh, in Tamil, for those that speak Tamil here, apologies for my bad Tamil. But uh, we, uh, we just uh, over there doing that and seeing God do great things in the western suburbs. Obviously, as you know, we also just uh, planted City Point out into Ipswich. It's great to see God moving out in Ipswich as well and uh, exciting to see what He's doing up the north and uh, through the locations here powerfully from the vision of our great senior pastors, as I said before. I want to just share with you tonight a little bit. My message is entitled, The Nobodies. The nobodies. You know, we live in a culture here in the world today that says a whole bunch of things, but one of the, the key things it says to us is that leopards, if you've ever heard this before, can't change their spots. Leopards can't change their spots. We get tarred with the challenges that we have around our lives that maybe some of us started with or maybe we picked up along the journey and, and we live life today and, and our culture today tries to squeeze us into a box that says this is all you're ever going to be. This is all you're ever going to amount to. This is all your life is ever going to be. You know, a, a couple of uh, months ago, uh, an old school teacher of mine sent me a message through Facebook. And uh, this school teacher, his name was Mr. Donald. He was actually the teacher in charge of discipline when I was at school back in Sydney. And uh, this school teacher sent me a message, said, hey, Tim, I don't know if you remember me. I'm Mr. Donald from school. I was your science teacher. And, uh, you know, I taught you for a number of years. Um, just wanted to send you a message. I've tried to contact many of the students that I've taught. Uh, I'm now on the Gold Coast teaching. And, uh, and you know, I just wanted to contact with you and, and see how you're going. Now, I saw this message. I'm like, I cannot believe this teacher has sent me a message. This guy was a teacher that disciplined me many, many times as a student. Now, I came from a day and age when we used to get the paddle if you did something wrong at school. Any old people in the room had the paddle when you did something wrong at school. Man, this guy paddled me, I don't know how many times. Uh, I remember one time I was joking with one of the teachers and uh, she gave me a bad mark and it was parent-teacher night. I said, my mum's coming in and uh, she's gonna beat you up tonight. Next minute, I'm in Mr. Donald's office and he's giving me the paddle again. Now, Mr. Donald was one of those guys that just loved giving the paddle. In fact, he was like one of the great Australian fast bowlers, Merv Hughes, when he gave you the paddle. He, he used to like get back up in the corner of the room. If you, anyone remember Merv Hughes, he used to get a big run up and he used, even got the paddle and he warmed it up on his legs so it made sure it hit you well and get a run up. He'd come in and he just like this, whack with that paddle and hit you on the backside and uh, you know, you'd get bruises. He had one of those paddles that had holes in it so it went better through the air and hit you harder. Man, the next day you'd like turn up at school and all the boys would go, man, check this out. You'd like showing them your backside with these bruises and holes where the holes in the paddle were. That's what this guy was like. He sends me a message. He sends me a message, Tim, you know, great to, to see you, you know, what are you doing with your life? I sent him a message back saying, hey, I'm actually now a pastor at City Point Church. Uh, I've been a pastor for the last 18 years. He didn't message me back for a couple of days. I reckon he actually dropped his phone and it broke and then he had to go and get a replacement so he could message me back. This guy, you know, was, just knew me as an absolute rat bag. In fact, when I was in grade 10 going to grade 11 at that school, you could run for prefect going into grade 11. So we had, you know, the running for prefect. I actually had to get up and say a speech. Now, I, I uh, was quite stupid when I was young and I got up and I said, my name's Tim, vote for me. Put the thing back down and walked off the platform. Everybody laughed. They thought it was hilarious. I got the most votes out of everybody at school. But Mr. Donald met with me the next day and he sat me down in his office. He said, Tim, you know, you got the most votes out of everybody, including some of the grade 11s going into grade 12. You got more votes than everybody there. But the teachers and I sat down and we discussed you being a prefect. And um, 
You know, most of the teachers don't know you, but they know your reputation. So we've decided you can't be a prefect. And we've voted more than the students and we're not gonna allow you to do that. Now, Mr. Donald had tarred me with a brush, a very well-deserved brush, I've gotta be honest. But he tarred me with this brush that said, you know, Tim's just a mess, just playing up all the time, just doing stupid things, just all of the things that I did continually. I remember one day, uh, we used to have cards that had merits and demerits. One side was for merits, the other side was for demerits. Now, I actually was really good at forging Mr. Donald's signature. And I remember this one day, my mates all around, I'm like, give me your merit cards. I'll give you all merits, give them merits. Next day, one of the boys come around and Mr. Donald goes, let me give you a merit. And he's like, oh, okay, he gives him the card. He's like, where'd you get these five merits from me? How did you do this? And he's like, oh, Tim McDonald gave them to me back into the, into the teacher's room. And this is him again, warming up that thing for a big one, bang. There was plenty of reasons I could go all night telling these stories. Plenty of reasons why he tarred me with his brush. But here he is 20 something years later and this same guy is sending him a message saying, hey, right now I'm a pastor, I'm changing the world, I'm living for Jesus Christ. The culture we live in says this, that was you at school, that was you in the past, that was you in your life, that were your actions, that were your words, that were the things that you did and you can never be anything else. This is one of the cultures that we live in. Another culture we have is that you have to be something and have to have everything together to make something of your life, to be something significant. You know, these two cultures, the, the challenge of our past, the challenge of what we've done, the challenge of what we've been through, added to the fact that you have to have it all together to be significant, makes people in this day and age very challenged when it comes to the fact they say, I wanna do something significant with my life. 1 Corinthians chapter one, verse 27 to 31. He says this, Paul writing, take a good look friends at who you were when you got called into this life. I don't see many of the brightest and the best among you, not many influential, not many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that culture overlooks and exploits and, and abuses, chooses these nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies. That makes it quite clear that none of you can get by with blowing your own horn before God. Everything we have, the right thinking, the right living, the clean slate and the fresh start comes from God by the way of Jesus Christ. That's why we have the saying, if you're gonna blow a horn, blow the trumpet of God. I love what this Scripture says to people like me and like you that maybe went through life with some challenges, made some mistakes and messed up a little bit. Listen to the words here that Paul says, your right thinking, your right living and the clean slate and the fresh start. The fresh start. The fresh start. You know, we don't live under the world's culture. We live under a God culture that says this, how you started doesn't dictate how you finish. Your challenges of the past don't dictate your future. The things that you walked through, the things that you did, the things that you said, don't dictate where you're going in the life that God has for you today. Praise God, that's the culture that you and I are born again under. It's the culture that our God has that says right now, you've got a second chance. You've got a fresh start. You've got a new beginning. The old slate is washed clean. The old challenges are gone. Our old weaknesses are becoming our strengths. This is the God culture that we live under. This is the culture that God is wanting to shape us under. He's wanting to put us together under. And you know what? Throughout the Word of God, we see men and women continually starting off a little poor, but God gets a hold of them. God starts to shape them. God starts to mould them. And out of the challenge of their past comes the greatest futures. You know, our senior pastor has a great vision, Brisbane becoming the city of God. For that dream and that vision to come to pass, it takes some young men and women, some mature men and women, leaving behind their past and saying, God, there's something great in my future. You know what? People around us may have tarred us with a brush that said you're a failure, said the mistakes are too great. 
but there's a God in heaven that washed that slate clean and says, hey, you know what? There's something significant that He wants to do with my life and to do with yours. We see this theme throughout the Word of God, continually throughout the Word of God. And one of the amazing pieces of Scripture that shows us powerfully this theme is Matthew chapter 1. It's a piece of Scripture that I love for many reasons, but some of the great reasons wrapped up in this being so important is, you know, there is power in the picture of this Scripture in the showing us what Jesus Christ is all about. This Scripture is a Scripture of the genealogy of our Lord and Saviour. This Scripture paints a picture for our future because it looks at where these lives came to giving us Jesus Christ. You know, there's been many attacks on these passages of Scripture throughout the millennium that we've walked through. We've seen attack after attack on this because this Scripture here gives us the kingship of Jesus, gives us the kingship of who He is. It shows us right here that Jesus, if we look at verse one, this is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. This gives us a picture of who He is. In fact, when Matthew was writing this, he was writing it claiming that Jesus was the Messiah. He was speaking to a group of people that had been looking for a Messiah. In fact, if we go back into 7 AD, we see a whole bunch of Jewish priests complaining and storming the streets. If we look in history books, we'll see this storming the streets, saying that the promise of God hadn't been fulfilled. They were complaining that the Messiah hadn't come. Yet, here was Jesus already walking out His life, already growing as a young man. Now here we are, the life of Jesus is over and Matthew is speaking to these same people that have stormed the streets and he's saying, look, here's your Messiah. Here's the Son of God. Here He is. But you know, there's been reasons for the challenges here. Some of the Scriptures that we look at, if we go just to verse 17 for a moment, I don't have it up there. In verse 17, it says this, there were 14 generations as it led down to David. Now there's 14 from David and it leads down to Jesus. Does everyone know that piece of Scripture in chapter 17 or have we all flossed over it too quick? You know, in fact, that Scripture in itself isn't correct. Let me just touch on that for a moment. There was in fact 14 generations from Abraham to David, but there was 17 generations from David through to Jesus. Now, many people have thrown around different ideas on why this is the case, but let me give you a quick skip, a scriptural picture of why this was the case. We have to, in fact, jump back to Scriptures like Deuteronomy 29.20, 20, where Deuteronomy 29.20 20 is talking about three kings whose names were blotted out of the Word of God because they worshipped idols. They laid idols down before them. They said this, they said, let the names be blotted out. Let us not speak those names again. Those three kings were Ahaziah, Joash and Amaziah. If you look in this genealogy, you won't find these three kings, even though they should be in here. They're not here because Deuteronomy, God's declaration was blotted out those names. We don't wanna speak of those names again. Ahaziah was killed by Jehu. Joash was killed by his servant. Amaziah was slain by the people of Jerusalem because they continued to worship idols even though they were kings and some of them were only kings for a very, very short period of time. People have attacked that Scripture and said it's wrong, it's incorrect, yet it's very correct if we understand the context here scripturally of what these people were. You know, we can go and look at some of these other Scriptures and some of these different ones by looking at Luke, for example. If you look at Luke and you read it for a moment, you'll read that the father of Joseph is different to the father of Joseph when we look at it in the book of Matthew. In the book of Matthew, Jacob's the father of Joseph. In the book of Luke, Heli is the father of Joseph. Now, is this scribes' errors? Have they got it wrong? Have they made a mistake? Have they mixed it up? And this is a great question to ask. But again, we need to go and understand the context of the culture and the understanding of the Word of God. We need to dig deep to find the answers to some of these questions to understand why our Messiah is the Messiah we worship. If these things aren't true, the Jesus we worship isn't the Messiah promised all the way back when. Now, 
This is really powerful. This is really important. Many of us have read statements like Genesis 3.15, that the seed of the woman would come. Have you ever thought through that concept of the seed of the woman? A woman doesn't have a seed, she has an egg. Again, is that a scribe's error or is that a prophetic word speaking of a virgin birth that was to come? This is important. We need to understand here, this isn't a misinterpretation of a scripture. It was a prophetic word. Isaiah picked up on this when he prophesied that there would be born of a virgin. When he speaks in Isaiah chapter seven, he is speaking of something so significant. Why is this significant? Well, if we go back and have a look for a moment in Jeremiah chapter 22, we would see Jeremiah speaking the words of God over the life of a man by the name of Jeconiah. Jeconiah was a king in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Right here, if we look at it in Matthew, we see the lineage of Jesus Christ with this man by the name of Jeconiah. And this is what God prophesied through Jeremiah in Jeremiah 22. He said, no descendant of this man, Jeconiah, shall sit on David's throne. God declared a blood curse over the line that was to come here in the line of Jesus. Can you imagine Satan up in there of hell coming around going, man, we've got him now. The Messiah's done. That's it. It's finished. It's over with. Can you imagine what he's thinking? They're partying. God's own words. He can't go back on that thing. This is incredible. But he forgot of what was hinted at in the, back, in the book of Genesis when he spoke of here, the woman bringing a seed. And when he saw Isaiah prophesying powerfully about a virgin birth, do you realise that here with Jeremiah 22, the only way a saviour could come through this line was a virgin birth that has no blood attachment to these guys. No blood attachment to the lineage we see here in the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew here didn't enable him to be attached. We go into Luke again and it speaks of Heli, this man being the, the father, being the father of Joseph. Now powerfully here, powerfully for our lives, we're gonna understand what's going on here. If we read it in the English, it says this, that Joseph, Heli was the father or supposed to be the father, sorry, Joseph was supposed to be the father of Jesus. But if we go back to the Greek, there's a word by the name of um, nomizo. This word means reckoned as by law. Now, I don't have the time to go into all of this, but if you wanna get a full grasp of this, you gotta go back into Numbers 27, uh, Joshua 17, uh, Ezekiel and Nehemiah and have a read about how people are connected here by law, how a man becomes the father of somebody else through marriage, through adoption. The outworking of that is now an inheritance that can come that's not a blood inheritance. Again, remember this. This was very, very important that Joseph would have that blood inheritance. Let's add to that John Gill's illustration that he wrote some 400 years ago in his commentary on this verse of Scripture in Luke where he spoke about the fact that if we go and look at this, it says here, leading us all the way back to Adam and to God right here, showing us that it says that Adam was the son of God. We go all the way through and we look at the picture here. Now, these sons, sons, sons was actually a picture of leading through the sonship in connection with God. He wasn't just showing us blood relatives. He was showing us the fact that we are all sons and daughters of God because of Jesus Christ and what He did in our lives. This Scripture is so powerful. And you know, if you wanna study something, come and study Matthew chapter one, and look at what it speaks to my life and to yours. Let's take a moment and look through some of Matthew chapter one. Let's look in verse two. Abraham begot Isaac. A man had a kid. Wow. Do you realise who Abraham was? He's a guy that if you go into the Bible, God speaks about in so many powerful ways. You know, he's the, he's the father here of this nation. He's, a, he's this amazing guy. But if you actually read for a moment about his life, you know what you read of? A guy that continually battled trusting God. You just read that verse for a moment. 
and you and I now have a picture of where God can use us. Has anyone here in this house ever had a battle trusting God? Ever had a challenge just trusting Him? You know, a few months ago, I was buying a house. I was about to just get everything sorted two days out. I rang my bank, everything all sorted, everything good. Oh no, we haven't received the paperwork from your uh, mortgage broker. I'm like, you haven't what? Ring the mortgage broker, what's going on? Oh yeah, well, I've sort of this and sort of that. And hey, we're two days out. Let's just get back on the bank. Hey, it'll be two weeks till we can get your paperwork sorted because of that. You know how much trust in God I had at that moment? I wasn't full of faith. I was full of, I want to kill that stupid bank lady. I'm going to find another bank, do it. What? Freaking out. I'll be honest. I was struggling with my trust in God. You know what my father said to me? It's going to be all right. God's going to work it out. You're an idiot. <laughs> this is crap. I'm going to try and work it out myself. I'm going to go here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to work it out myself. Here's Abraham. God promises him, man, you know what? You're going to have a son. You're going to be a father of many nations. This guy waits years and years and years. You know what his outcome is here? His outcome's right like this. Uh, yep, I'm going to just take your handmaiden and I'm going to sleep with her and she's going to have a son because Sarah, you're barren. It's not working out for us. I'm going to take somebody else and here's my own outworking of this. Anyone ever tried just doing it in your own strength because we've lost the trust in God? We've all gone through moments like that. Man, here I am, two days out. How am I gonna work this thing out? I'm ringing other banks. Can you do something quickly? No, I can't. Can you do something? I'm ringing my existing bank. What about just we work this? No, no, no. Everything's not working out. A day out. Man, Dad's like, it's gonna be okay. I really feel God's gonna come through in this. I'd speak to the bank, two weeks. That's it. We can rush, we can do whatever. It's still gonna be two weeks. Dad's saying, it's going to be fine. We'll work this. God's going to be on this thing. My trust is just getting weaker and weaker. You know what? It got to two hours before closing time. I'd done signed papers. I'd raced all over. And the bank's going, you know what? We just can't do it. It's just not going to happen. My dad's going, it's going to be good. God's got it. God's got it. I'm still an idiot. God's got it. God's got it. You know what? Time went past. I'm like packed up my house. I'm out the front moving truck. I'm looking at sleeping at City Point West because I don't know where I'm going, what's going on. I got a text message from the bank. Your application's been done. The funds have been processed. You can move into your new house. You know, sometimes we can stand here so full of faith, praise God for His goodness. But you know what was going on for two days? I was freaking out, struggling, sleeping. My trust in God wasn't doing so well. I was just really stressing out about this. But when we look at the life of Abraham, a guy that tried to work it himself, tried to do his own thing, you know the outcome here? The outcome is this. God speaks of him later on and says this, this guy had faith. Hebrews writer says, this guy had faith. This guy had faith. The greatest part of this challenge, the greatest thing that we can see when we read this and understand it is it doesn't matter where we get from the moments of time where we lose our trust in God we can always come back and allow faith to stir in our hearts because the Spirit of God becomes to work in us and He builds us up. People that maybe once struggled, now we can stand filled with faith and strength. If you've struggled trusting God, He can still use you. He can still get a hold of your life. He can still make sure that your life can do something incredible. Some of my biggest challenges in ministry over the last 18 years have been simply trusting in God trusting Him. His Word spoke and just to hold on. You know, some of my greatest hardships have been the moments that I've had to trust Him the most. Because of those hardships, He's built faith and expectancy that He can transform the world through my life and through those I'm working with and working beside. We read a little further. Next, next person here, we got Isaac, but got Jacob. He's the son of Abraham, the son of the great man that found faith and found expectancy and saw a miracle. Even the Bible tells us when he was nearly dead, has this child, Isaac, wow. Wouldn't you think this guy would be filled with just faith and expectancy for everything he did? Yet yeah, you know what? He bumped into a king one day and he was so full of fear. He said, oh, my wife's my sister. Yep, yep, she's my sister. He was so filled with fear that this king would kill him 
that that was his response. Any wives in the house be happy if your fearful husband told somebody that your wife was your sister? Sort of bad because she was sort of was, but anyway, we won't go into that. <laughs> what was the, the deal here? He was full of fear. You know, I think of my own life. You know what my greatest fear was? Standing up on a pulpit and holding a microphone. I told that story about going for my speech. I had this great speech worked out of the things I was gonna say. When I spoke, my name's Tim. I'm like, crap, my voice sounds stupid. Uh, vote for me, hung up the microphone. Yeah, I'm the man, everyone laughing at me. I'm just freaking out right now. That was my greatest fear. I always feared it. I never wanted to do it. When it come to doing, you know, English, standing up in front of people, man, I had never had more sick days than when I had one of those moments. <coughs> On my throat, my anything, I'm just not going to school right now. I hated standing in front of people, but here God gets a hold of me, takes my fears, breathes on them, and begins to breathe a strength out of it. You know, it doesn't matter where you start in this thing. Maybe you're battling with fear right now. God can get a hold of your life and He can use you. He can get a hold of your great fears. He can breathe on them the strength and the courage that's in Jesus Christ and allow those fears to transform people all the time. I think my greatest fear, the thing the devil most wanted to stop me doing has been something that God has breathed on. Now I've travelled across the world preaching Jesus Christ. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of people in the last years one to Jesus because of just God breathing on my fear. If we go next, it says, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. You know that word Jacob meant deceiver and supplanter. Deceiver and supplanter. Can you imagine your parents just sort of trying to think through what they're gonna name you and they're like, Deceiver sounds like a good name. Yep. Hey, Deceiver, how are you going? Can you imagine going to school? The roll call. Uh, is Deceiver here? Anybody? Is Deceiver here? You'd be like, down behind. That's me. I'm Deceiver. I'm Jacob. Can you imagine your whole life carrying a name? You know, that was me through school. That's Tim McDonald. Mr. Donald telling everybody, that's Tim. That's Tim. That's Tim McDonald. Yep, we can't put him in as prefect. We know how he'll act, what he'll do. We carry a name. But I love what that scripture says. There's a fresh start in Jesus Christ. Maybe your name, maybe you felt like the things that have been spoken over you have held you bound, have tied you down, have tied you to your past. Maybe it's friends speaking the name. You know, I love bumping into old school friends. Every time they see me, they're like, this idiot, how did he ever do what he's doing? I don't know. Just dumbfounded by that, dumbfounded by the fact that God could use me because of the fresh start. I don't know what people try and hold over you, your past, your actions, the name, but I know this, there's a fresh start in Jesus Christ. We go on further. And Judah begot Perez and Zerah, by Tamar. Man, here is the most crazy story. If you wanna read Genesis 38, this story will blow your mind that it's even in the Bible. We're talking about a story of a guy who marries a woman, has three sons. He gets a girl to marry his eldest son. The eldest son sins, dies, doesn't have a child. So he passes that daughter on to the next down son. He sleeps with her. He if you read the story, you'll know that he doesn't cause her to be pregnant by doing inappropriate things. He then dies. This is in the Bible, by the way, in case you're wondering. He then dies. So this guy promises, okay, I've got another son when he's old enough, you can marry him. Time goes by. She notices that that son has grown up and she hasn't been given to the third son. He is just doing life and his wife dies to those three sons. So the Bible says he now goes out to be comforted and hang out with a bunch of his mates. In fact, he's on the prowl because she puts on clothes, dresses like a harlot and goes and hides and he comes out, sees her and says, hey, can I come and sleep with you? 
She is pretending to be a harlot. She says, only if you give me your signet ring and your staff and you allow me to have that, then you give me a goat and these things later on and I'll give you the stuff back. This is in the Bible, by the way. Again, I'm just reminding you. He sleeps with her. She becomes pregnant with these two twins. He hears of this, doesn't realise it's her. He obviously wasn't paying too much attention, but anyway, we'll keep going. Doesn't realise it's her. He hears that she's pregnant. He comes angry. Ah, this woman's played the harlot. Find out who she's had this child to, who she's having these children to. She says, I had these children to the guy that gave me this staff and I gave me the signet ring. He's like, whoa. He makes this statement. She has been more righteous than we. Now, he's not saying she is righteous. He's saying my actions were so bad that she was better than I was because I was so terrible. You know the outcome of this? The outcome is a guy by the name of Perez, an illegitimate basketballer. He's an illegitimate child. He's got hideous family history. You know, some of us walk into this room carrying some hideous family history, some mess. This mess, no doubt, sometimes affects our soul, affects our mind. Sometimes we're just struggling with who we are because of the mess of family, the mess of past, the mess of what we've walked through, the mess of what's going on around our life. We, we're trying to serve God, but that mess keeps coming back. You know, we had a woman recently come to City Point West. She walked in. You know what she came out of? She's a Thai woman. She was born a Buddhist. She's been a drug addict for the last 10 years. Her family's mixed up, just crazy. But one night she had a dream and a man spoke to her in a dream and said this, come home. She woke up the next day going, what's this dream about? I don't understand it. I don't know it. I, I, I don't know what's going on but she had a desire started to stir up in her heart saying hey I want to go to church she'd never been to church she's a Buddhist woman I, I feel like I need to go to church here's this Buddhist woman drug addict I need to go to church and she had a son who played soccer with a, another woman that had been saved at City Point West a Muslim woman who came uh, from Indonesia found Christ came to West and she knew this woman went to church so she went and spoke to this woman and said hey can I come to church with you? This woman said, yeah, no worries, that'd be great. Brought her along to church. She was stepped foot in the front door of City Point West and a feeling just washed over her body. This is the home that that man spoke about. I preached that day. I never knew who she was. I never knew what was going on in this woman's life, but I preached about Jesus. And she just said, at the moment I mentioned the name Jesus, she saw that vision come alive to her again and she felt that man who spoke to me was Jesus. That man who spoke to me in that dream and called me home was Jesus. Now she's living for God. She's free of those addictions. She's set free from Buddhism. She's serving the King. She's on fire for God. You know, the family mess is continually getting broken off that life. Now, she comes to me every Sunday and she's like, oh, I believe God's just stirring me up. I believe He's called me to do miracles. I believe that, that I'm gonna see miracles through my life. Hey, that's, that's awesome. We just start teaching her, this is how you pray, this is how you believe. She'd come to me one day, she's like, God, just stir me up to intercede for the lost and the broken. That is brilliant. You know why? Because she looked past those family struggles she saw a slate that was washed clean in the name of Jesus Christ and she obeyed the voice of a Saviour that called her home. If we skip down to verse five, Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. You know who Rahab is? She was a harlot. One night, two men knocked at her door. She thought, well, I'm getting some business tonight. But these two men were in fact, men who were spying out the land. You know what she did? Hey, God's at work here. These guys have traveled all the way here and they've fought back everybody that's come. You know what? God's at work. This woman just saw that God was at work and hid these two spies and released them out and said this, if I hide you and release you, make sure that I'm saved. We know this story. If you go and read it in Joshua, you see powerful story. What, what did she do? She was a harlot. She wasn't supposed to be one of the Israelite people. She was, in fact, 
just a, a resident of Jericho, a city that's about to be utterly destroyed and everybody killed. But she sensed God was at work and God was moving and she acted on the move of God. You know, for some of us in this room right now, we're a part of a powerful move of God. And our job is just to see God moving and us to move with Him. What we've done in the past doesn't matter. Rahab's past mattered nothing. All that mattered is she saw God moving and she moved with Him. You know, some of us in this room, that's a word for you right now. Your, your past has just tried to pull you back, pull you back. It's time to see what God's doing, see how He's moving, seeing young men and women leading you, young adults, chubs, just leading you and with the fire of God, just say, I wanna get on board with what's going on in the young adults. And, you know, to see your youth society say, you know, I see Chris and Shannon, I wanna get on board with what's going on with that thing. There's a move of God happening. Oh, but my past. Man, if Rahab can see the move of God, and just activate her life with that, you can grab a hold of it. You can grab a hold of it. You know, a few years ago, a number of years ago, a woman by the name of Bronwyn Henry, Henry walked into this church as a prostitute, saying, I wanna get set free. She did, she found Christ. Today, she travels the world preaching and, and seeing people's lives transformed, rescuing women out of that. Why? She saw the move of God and she said, I wanna be a part of it. We read further, Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. If you go into Ruth 2, you see this is another woman. She wasn't supposed to fit in with everybody else. Her heritage was ungodly. Her heritage wasn't the heritage that should have fit into this story. Yet it does, because she prayed a simple prayer. She said this, let your God be my God. You know, for some of us in this room, our heritage doesn't fit. I met a woman two years ago in an outreach we did at Christmas time down in the local uh, park down near our church. We're doing this outreach and my wife, Wendy, was singing. This woman stayed and she just afterwards threw her four-year-old child as an interpreter, spoke to my wife. She was an Iranian asylum seeker. She just got off a boat. She'd been through Manus Island. She'd been through uh, Darwin and now come and living here in Brisbane as an asylum seeker. She was a Muslim. She just threw her son, spoke to my wife and said, you know what? Your voice is just beautiful. My wife said to her, hey, I'm singing tomorrow at church as well. You should come along there. She came along. She brought her young son and her elder son. They came into church and sat down. I met them again that day, talked to them again. She came back a month later. I met her again, spoke to her again. She told me she's a Muslim. She told me she's come as an asylum seeker here into Australia. I saw her a month later again and I spoke to her again. She said she enjoyed listening to the people sing because their voices were nice and lovely and obviously was interested in being a part of church. So I said, let's just meet up and start to just talk about Jesus. You know, this woman had no biblical context. In fact, her only one came from reading the Quran that says that Jesus made birds out of clay and they flew. And she said, is that true? I'm like, hey, you know what? It's not the Bible. It could be, I don't know. We started to talk. You know, over a 12 month period, she found this love for Jesus. She started to come to church all the time, still struggling. Her English is really bad. She can't understand. She sits next to her son and he tells her what I'm preaching about. She come along to the church, we meet, we talk. First time I met with her, I met with her for a couple of hours and said, all right, I want you to read this and we'll catch up next week. You can't be finished. You need to tell me more. I wanna hear more. Tell me more about this. And we'd talk till 10 o'clock at night until I said, you know, I gotta go home. This woman just hungry. You know, three months ago, she decided she wanted to be water baptised. She said, that's it. I wanna become a Christian. I wanna get water baptised. I sat down through her son. We talked through water baptism. We talked about what this looks like. We talked about what this means. And I asked her, I said, would you like to say anything when you go into the you know, tank? And she'd not really seen much of that. She's trying to understand it all. Would you like to say anything? She said this through her son. She said, I'd like to say that I now realise Jesus is the son of the one true God, the saviour of the world. Powerful, powerful. Now, this is cool. I said, okay, so your son interpret for you? No, no, I'm gonna go home all week and practice in English. I'm gonna say it myself. 
powerful. That Sunday, she walked into those waters of baptism in the most hideously broken English you've ever seen. She said, Jesus is the son of the one true God, the saviour of the world. I cried for an hour, like a baby, beautiful. Here's this woman now in love with Jesus. The next week she brought a, a friend of hers from Iran, again, asylum seeker and their whole family. I met them, they had better English than her. I said, why did you come? I've seen her change this week and I want what she's got. I want what's happened in her life. Something's changed in her world. You know what her heritage was? Islam, asylum seeker, Iranian Muslim. How many of us today think of Iranian Muslims walking into Australia and we say they shouldn't be here? She was rejected in her own country because she was Kurdish. She's rejected here in Australia because she came illegally. But in amongst all that, she finds Jesus Christ. She finds Jesus. She prayed a prayer. Let your God be my God. Just like this woman, Ruth, she was a Moabitess. She didn't fit. She was rejected by everybody. She's rejected in her own country from Aaron and Israelite, but now she comes, she prays a prayer, says, let your God be my God. And now here she is, clean slate, second chance in the lineage of Jesus Christ, ungodly heritage. You know, I could read through and through, we touch in the life of men like David. Here's a guy that should have known better, but stuffed up terribly. To be honest, fits perfectly in my life. I was a pastor's kid. Yet at the age of 16, completely walked away from God, sat in those rows up the back over there, mocking what was going on in church. Partying, carrying on, acting like an idiot, should have known better. Yet at 19, right where that unmistakably influenced our world for good and for God, I encountered Jesus Christ. I wept for three hours as my life was utterly transformed. And from that day, I haven't looked back. From that day, I haven't stopped transforming people for Jesus Christ. Within a week, I was outreaching into Whites Hill High School. Within three months, we'd seen 30 kids wonder Jesus Christ. We'd started two life groups and seen a multiplication of leadership. Why? Because God just looked at me, a filthy, dirty, rotten sinner and said, my righteousness is better than that and can set you free can transform your life and set you on fire for the kingdom. We see David, this guy who should have known better, yet God breathes on him. And now he's spoken of as a man with a heart after God, like God's own heart. We can read through, touch on the guys like Joram. He's an absolute mess, evil, killed all of his relatives. We can go to a guy like Josiah. If we go into verse 11, you know, this guy was eight years old when he became king. Many would say he was too young. I know there's people in this room, many would say you're too young. You're too young. You, you haven't got the maturity. You know, I was 22 when I became the youth pastor here. 22 years of age. I had no ministry experience. I was a roof tiler. My experience was going in and seeing kids one for Jesus Christ and kids were getting saved and that was it. I'd never preached a message till I became a youth pastor. My first one was a disaster. Second was pretty close behind. But you know what? God breathed on me and 18 years later, I haven't stopped changing the world for Jesus Christ. I could go on and on and on through Matthew chapter one, looking at these lives that God just kept breathing upon, breathing upon. Every time I do, my excuses get blown away. My excuses get washed away. Too young, too much of a mess. My past, my family's past how I got here, all those things just get washed away. Just get washed away. All of us across the room are in the same boat. Maybe we've had fear, maybe we've struggled trusting. Maybe we've messed up so bad. King David, murdered, committed adultery. Yet in the end of his days, it was said of him, he had a heart like God's own heart. I don't know where you're from. I don't know what you've walked through, but I do know 
the future that God has for you. From the youngest in this room to the oldest, I know the future. I know the past doesn't matter. I know your name doesn't matter. I know what's been said about you doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that God is breathing upon you and breathing upon your future. We're gonna become like Rahab, see God moving and just jump on board. See where God's activating and just jump on board. You know, the first step of that is just to receive what God has already done through Jesus Christ. Right across this room, there may be people here that need to receive that today. It's called the grace of God. It's where He breathes upon your life, His righteousness. He comes to restore some of those mistakes, those failures, those things that have gathered around you. This is the beauty of the Gospel. This is the beauty of the truth in Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here right now and I'd love us to bow our heads and close our eyes for a moment.